Was there time travel in the original Final Fantasy VII? Hi there, my name is Michael. I've been following the Final Fantasy VII Remake theory train for the last three years. I played the original probably 30 times, um, but I've watched all the content creators. Sleep Easy, Schrodinger's Baby Seal, Subtext, uh, Night Sky Prince, uh, Philip Hartshorn, Ray Kaufman. I've, I've watched even smaller channels that I can't remember the names of. And I remember when Soldier First Class basically jumped ship, was like, I don't want anything to do with this series anymore. And I've contributed in the comments on Reddit and YouTube, going back and forth with people. Uh, oh, Dashing David, that's another big one. Sorry, I forgot about him. Anyway, I would like to provide one more theory right before Final Fantasy VII Rebirth comes out. And before I say anything else, we have to say that there are massive spoilers ahead. All right, massive, massive spoilers. If you have not played the remake, if you have not played the original Final Fantasy VII from 1997, please go play those and maybe come back to the video if you want. But really, this is not gonna be for you. So, you've been warned. And three, two, one. Is remake a sequel? <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, that's one of the big questions that I have, that other people have, that people have been debating about. I think the minority of people now in the fan base think that it's actually a remake. Um, I tend to think that they're not going to say that it's a direct sequel to the original game. I tend to think it's more so the amalgamation of the compilation and a reimagining with Future Sight. But the goal here is to just show you that in the original game, a lot of the stuff that's in Remake that seems like it's just completely new, the themes and some of the mechanics and stuff, I think we can show that there was precedence for it in the original. And if we can show that the original had aspects of time shenanigans and fate and alternate reality bending stuff, um, then it, what it means is that the remake does not have to be a sequel, right? It doesn't have to be if those things were kind of in the original. So I just want to put this out there and basically prepare everyone to be okay with either, right? That's kind of how I'm thinking about it. I don't care if it's a sequel. I don't care if it's an, just a remake. Some people have said, oh, if it's a remake, um, I, I'm not on board with that, you know. Or they've said, actually, I get now that it's a sequel. Um, but now, and now, if it's actually just a remake, I'm going to be disappointed. Let's just, just temper our expectations for a second, you know. And go in and see how it could be either, and either has precedence. So... Here's the theory. Sephiroth has already utilized time travel in the original Final Fantasy VII, and it is being greatly expanded in Remake to explain how he will enact his plan to summon Meteor, create the future, and become a god. The themes of fate and destiny, defying destiny, are in the script of OG FF7, but easily overlooked until Remake exaggerated them for us. Sephiroth's purpose for this will be to alter the nature of the life stream so that he will not end and not become a part of it one day. He wants to retain himself and never die. In the Seven Re Trilogy, we will see how he can achieve his end game, which was unseen in the original game. All right, so how do you create the future and not end? One, Learn and alter the memories of the planet. Go back in time. Two, create a stagnant reality that does not operate in the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Okay. Look at the image I have on screen here. The world will be saved, but will you? And there's Aerith saying in the background um, as an overlay, 
the sky, I don't like it. And you see this crack and this fissure in the sky. You see Zack holding an unconscious cloud. A lot of people have speculated that it's two timelines. We have one timeline that, like, just has different events and another has another events. And they're going to merge or something and that's it, right? Um, I don't think it's as simple as that. I've always thought, I was always on the one timeline train, but it seems harder and harder to uphold that theory as we've seen these kinds of things, right? However, I think that this might be on the right track. So a stagnant reality that does not operate in the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. And a third point here, how do you create the future and not end? Sephiroth saying, but I will not end. Number three here, destroy the reality that does operate in the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. So, now, number one, how do you learn the memories of the planet? How do you go back in time? Well, first of all, we have to establish if you can even do that. Is that in the original game? Well, let's look at this first. Tell me what you see here. All right, we have the original game. Aerith is looking at a pool in the Temple of the Ancients here. And she's talking to a consciousness. Okay. And it's warning her of an evil consciousness that's within uh, the temple or the live stream or something. And then we are instantly transported to the recent past. Okay. And we can see. She says, wait, look, it's showing us. And we can just see exactly what goes down here inside the temple. Okay. So now let me show you another one. Here's another technology that the ancients had. Okay. There's a key. It operates this mechanism. There's water that comes down, goes on to um, this image generating materia plant like thing. And then we see an image as if we're watching a movie. And there it is. Okay. Recent past exact rep replication of what happened, what occurred in the past. And we can see it. Here's another one. This is in the live stream in Cloud's mind. We have Tifa and Cloud, right? A broken Cloud. And we are going into the past. And we are looking through memories via the live stream, right? So you could argue this is a sort of time travel. If you can go back into the past and you can see things recreated exactly, well, then you can learn exactly what occurred in the past, right? In order to help you shape the present and the future, if there's hidden knowledge back there, okay? So it's not exact back to the future time travel right now, is it? But it is like relearning and visualizing and experiencing it, you know, as if it's a VR simulation or a movie, right? Okay. So now, I would like to draw your attention to this scene here. This is Sephiroth. He says, I became a traveler of the live stream and gained the knowledge and wisdom of the ancients. I also gained the knowledge and wisdom of those after the extinction of the ancients. And soon, I will create the future. Okay. Now, it's really interesting, this this scene here. I think this is huge for what's happening in the remake. As I said in my original theory, that we will get to see how Sephiroth will not end. How he will create the future, right? He, we're going to see that in remake. And I think we're starting to see it already. Now, in the original game, he says he was a traveler of the life stream. Okay? So, and he gained the knowledge and wisdom of the ancients. And then it says he gained the knowledge and wisdom of the ancients after the ex their extinction. So, he's like gone back and just like watched and learned everything for like eons. Okay, up until like now. And then he says, and soon I will create the future. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to something about that word 
create when it comes to the future here. This is really interesting. This is from Tim Rogers, who translated it. Listen. Forms the first character in the two kanji word, sozo, which means creation in a biblical sense. I'm mostly mentioning this just so I can say that in Japanese, the game Terranigma is called Tenshi Sozo, the creation of heaven and earth. In summary, Sephiroth is talking hecka godlike right now. Eris and Clouds. Okay, did you catch that? Sephiroth is talking hecka godlike right now. The word create in the Japanese is in a biblical sense, meaning creation event. Okay, now what do we see in Remake from that? Right? We have a weird reality, maybe a multiple timeline thing. Some weird timeline shenanigans. He says he was a traveler of the life stream. He gained their knowledge. Okay, so let's, let's, you know, and then he says in the original that he's going to create the future after he went back to the past and learned a bunch of stuff, right? And he's going to create it like a god creates something. Okay, so really interesting, right? Now, let's just take a look at the Time Guardian, which is in the original game. It's just kind of a throwaway minigame, you think, but what if they're greatly expanding this whole mechanism, right? Now, let's look at the gameplay of what happens when you first come upon this clock. I am the Time Guardian, ye who seek the knowledge of the ancients. I control the time, select your path. Really interesting, isn't it? So... Look at Sephiroth. I became a traveler of the life stream and gained the knowledge and wisdom of the ancients. And then the Time Guardian says, if you seek the knowledge of the ancients, I control the time. Right? So, I think that's really interesting that we can we can see things with ancients, tech, or with life stream power. We can see the past and it can be represented to us perfectly. Right? And now, there's also a really interesting thing here on this, though, on this uh, minigame. It says, go back in time and speed up time. So, and another thing I'd like to point out is that once we do go through these things, here, let me, let me go back for a second. It looks kind of like, like here. There's some broken paths, you know, some blocked pathways. It almost seems like in the original game, the, the, t the time guardian, the clock thing, is just, it's like not functional. That's what it seems like to me. It always seemed like an ancient technology that's no longer functional, you know? Like a materia, like, they're like, like there's like a giant materia underneath that talking mouth thing. And it's just like lost its energy or something. You know, or maybe, maybe this is how Sephiroth did it. You know, maybe this is why we see him earlier in Remake. Is that the clock is broken because Sephiroth used it. Okay, or maybe he destroys it, you know by the time we see it. Maybe if it's just a remake, you know, it's actually a remake, um, it'll be explained that he used the Time Guardian, you know, to come back and start affecting things. The Whispers tried to correct. We destroyed the Arbiter, um, the Harbinger, right? And the reason this clock thing is broken is because maybe it is like the Harbinger. Maybe it's now like just sitting there you know, it's like just a mouth. That's all that's left of it after we were done with it. I don't know. It's just a thought. It's interesting that there is an arbiter of fate and a, in the remake, but also a time guardian in the original that has a special clock that can go forward and backward in time. Kind of interesting, right? Kind of interesting. So let's move on here. Um, just a tidbit here. The image on the right is called relativity. Okay. Now, um, so it's it's kind of 
it's kind of interesting to me. It's like, why do the ancients have a massive talking magical clock that only acts as a bridge between hallways? It seems like the device is broken. I think this gives us a kernel of precedence in the original game for some kind of time travel mechanic. Okay? Now, the other thing I would like to establish is the evidence for fate and defying destiny in Remake and in the original game. Because a lot of people say that these are the kind of things that were not in the original and that they are ruining the remakes, uh, the, the Final Fantasy VII story in Remake by adding these elements. But I, you know, I kind of think that these are concepts that are in there. So now, let me just go through some of these. First one. Our world will become a part of it one day, but I will not end. Nor will I have you end. Okay. Great song, by the way. So, he says, But I will not end, nor will I have you end. Right? In Remake, he doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to end. He doesn't want Cloud to end for some unknown purpose, right? And he says, in the beginning of that, that our world will become a part of it one day. Um... And it's kind of implied through some of the compilation stuff that it'll become a part of the greater life stream. Like the planets will die and, you know, be reborn and the life stream kind of cycles through. And even planets have this uh, mechanic. And Sephiroth's saying, you know, our world's going to become a part of that one day. So he doesn't want it to, right? He doesn't want to end. He doesn't want to lose himself to the life stream. So he wants to avoid this inevitable end. All right. Now. Let's see. Was this idea in the original? Okay, let's see. Let's hear what Bugenhagen has to say. Interesting there. Hold on a second. I gotta say, show that again. Looking up too much makes you lose perspective. That's what Bugenhagen says. And look at Sephiroth here. Looking up. This is <laughs> you know, that's kind of, isn't that kind of great right there? Uh... So there's Sephiroth looking up all lofty, losing perspective. Okay. So, so um, Bugenhagen here says, When it's time for the planet to die, you'll understand that you know absolutely nothing. And Cloud asks, when the planet dies? It may be tomorrow or 100 years from now, but it's not long off. Cloud asks him, how do you know this? I hear the cries of the planet. Huh. Okay. So, the way that Bugenhagen knows the planet is going to end is that he hears the cries of the planet. Isn't that interesting? So let's hear what he says further. Cloud, what's that? The sound of the stars in the heavens. While this goes on, planets are born and die. Remember Sephiroth, our world will become a part of it one day. And we hear That was a scream from the planet. Didn't you hear it as if to say I hurt, I suffer? Okay. So. Bugenhagen believes the same as Sephiroth. That's interesting, right? Remake, Sephiroth and Remake is saying the same thing that Bugenhagen is saying. Listen, watch this. Here's some more, more points to make. Cloud says they're trying to save the planet. Honestly, I don't think it can be done. For even if they stop every reactor on the planet, it's go only going to postpone the inevitable. Even if they stop Sephiroth, everything will perish. Uh, 
but I've been thinking lately. I've been thinking if there was anything we could do as a part of the planet, something to help a planet already in misery. It's important to try. Am I just wishing against fate? Okay, so now we have this kind of throwaway line if you played the original, you know. So much more significant, I think, um, for the remake. Okay. So now that we have the remake, um, let us defy destiny together, right? Now that we have all that going on, and what is the destiny? What are we defying? Um, one aspect is the inevitable end of the planet, which is in the original right here. Bugenhagen says, even if we stop every reactor, even if we stop Sephiroth, the planet will end. Am I just wishing against fate? So this is in the original, okay? Sephiroth knows this as well, as we've shown. And there is another, you know, through line to this, which is the destiny that Sephiroth wants to defy as well could be his, you know, whose will is is stronger when it comes to Genova and him. But that's another, you know, that's a totally other subject, ma another subject matter. So here it is. I think, I think this is pretty good that we have some evidence here in the original that the planet's going to end. It's inevitable. Um, and this is the fate of the planet. This is the de destiny that Sephiroth wants to defy. Okay. And Aerith even says this, remember, at the highway. She says, um, he'll tell you that he just wants to save the planet, you know? But that's not the way it's supposed to be, right? So that's all um, tracking right now between the original and the remake. So, Bugenhagen said, he no, he's wishing against, am I just wishing against fate, you know? Now, here's the interesting piece, too. When Bugenhagen told Cloud that he hears the cries of the planet, and this is signifying the inevitable end, basically. This is signifying the death of the planet. Let's see in Remake if there's a through line, a parallel there. All born are bound to her. All born are bound to her. Should this world be unmade, so too shall her children. Should this world be unmade, so too shall her children. And then listen to what Cloud says here. Cloud says the world won't end today. Remember, Bugenhagen says the screaming, the cries of the planet, tells you that it is going to end. And Cloud here says, the world won't end today. The world won't end today. Be you. And then what do we hear? What is, what is Sephiroth's retort to Cloud saying the world won't end? Listen. Will. He says, listen, Cl Sephiroth's argument to Cloud is, well, the cries of the planet. Watch. Here they come. Destiny comes. Destiny comes. Okay, so what did we say? The cries of the planet signify the inevitable end. And what is the destiny that Sephiroth wants to defy? The inevitable end. He's saying, so the cries of the planet, defying destiny, the end of the world. They're all like the same thing. All right? It's in the original. It's in the remake. Okay? Whether or not it's a sequel or not, kind of doesn't matter right now it's just showing i'm just showing that this stuff has precedence okay just to kind of prepare you for whatever it is it is okay great okay so that's great now yeah so i think i've shown that point you see the parallels there now here's some further evidence for the themes of fate and destiny, okay, in the original. I mean, we already saw Bugenhagen say, you know, it's inevitable and in that he's wishing against fate, okay? But here, check this out. 
This is the lyrics to One Winged Angel at the end of the game in the original. It says, burning inside with violent anger, burning inside, Sephiroth, Sephiroth. Fate, monstrous and empty. Come, oh come, do not let me die. Isn't that exactly the same as what Sephiroth is saying at the edge of creation to Cloud? He's saying, I will not end, nor will I have you end, right? Oh, come, oh, come, do not let me die. Fate monstrous and empty. Let us defy destiny together, right? It's the same thing. It was in the original game. Um, it's just that it's not as in your face and fleshed out and acted and everything. I think, like I said, they in the remake, they want to show us how they want to show us how Sephiroth is going to achieve this. So, um, and also, it's not just in the original game. They also put it in Advent Children, in this in the One Winged Angel Advent Children version. But the lyrics are a little different. It's kind of interesting. It says, "Don't remain in memory, fierce anger and pain, wild, terrible fate." My son, come, my son. He who invited death was born with an ill-fated punishment. Don't call his name the second advent, Sephiroth. So it's kind of interesting in this one, it says wild, terrible fate. The other one says monstrous, empty fate. Why is fate empty? You know, why is fate empty? Um, it's empty if your choices don't matter. And it's also empty if the inevitable end comes, right? Everything will go away. All the memories, everything, right? Mm, at least in Sephiroth's mind, maybe. But that's why fate is empty is because if you if you can't retain something of yourself then it, 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 what was it all for does it does it mean anything you know so anyway it's consistent is what i'm trying to say sephiroth defying destiny and not ending are in the original it's in advent children it's in remake this is all consistent um here's some more evidence for the through lines between the original and the remake when it concerning uh, when it concerns the whispers. So in this one, here's a little wiki about these things. It says, in an early version of the game script, the Sephiroth clones were not people, but rather parts of Genova, floating in the air, covered by their cloaks. During important plot points. They would reveal themselves to be pieces of Genova's body, her right arm, heart, etc. They also replaced Sephiroth in several scenes, such as the pivotal one in the City of the Ancients. This is kind of mind-blowing. To me. Because that would mean that that could mean that the whispers are literally just an old concept revitalized for the remake. Right? We even saw in the latest trailer at the uh, Game Awards, there's the scene at the Capitol, at the altar scene or whatever, and in the background there's a whisper flying, right? And it says that they also replaced Sephiroth in several scenes, such as the pivotal one in the City of the Ancients. So I guess in an early concept of the game, they had whispers floating around at that scene. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? That's really interesting. So, so I asked the question, is it a remake or is it a sequel? Is it a reimagination, uh, an amalgamation of the compilation? You know? Okay. Moving on. And I love how Cloud here, when he attacks this one, he goes, what are you? <laughs> yeah, we don't know. But they've got something to do with Genova, it seems like. Okay, here's a little more evidence about the through lines. Okay. Um, in Advent Children, Vincent calls Genova Heaven's Dark Harbinger. And the Harbinger... In remake, 
is an accretion of whispers, the so-called arbiters of fate. The creatures appear when someone tries to alter destiny's course. They are connected to all the threads of time and space that shape the planet's fate. Um, what do you think the chances are that Bugenhagen will know what the whispers are already? You know? Maybe that's why um, in the original... You know, if they're drawing from the original for with the whispers in mind, they could say something like, yeah, in the original, the reason Bugenhagen knows it's inevitable is because of the whispers. And then we're going to be like, yeah, well, we took those things out, <laughs> you know, and that'll be a really interesting conversation. I can't really speculate much more than that. But, you know, just something else I just wanted to point out that... Uh, the Harbinger seems to have been something that was in Advent Children. And it's really interesting, you know, as Sleep Easy's pointed out, that the Harbinger has this, like, all this purple stuff on it that signifies Genova. So it's like, is that really just, like, a destiny course-correcting thing, like, mechanic? Or is that some kind of corrupted life stream monster because of Genova and... That's the destiny that we need to defy. I don't know. But very interesting nonetheless. And I just wanted to show that other th through line there. Okay. So let me just say that as a side note, I really like that if this is the direction, right, um, we're getting to see – how Sephiroth will enact his plan to create the future, right? From the original game when he said that. I think we're going to get to see how this, these mechanisms work. I think the whispers are part of that. I think the alternate reality with Zack, whether it's timeline, time travel, live stream shenanigans, they don't know they're dead, whatever. Okay. I think that's part of it as well. And that'll all be, that'll all go into creating the future. So, and I think this makes Sephiroth a lot more relatable as a character. So, you know, he doesn't want to be annihilated. He, you know, like, and if you think of things like heaven and hell, who wants to be tortured in hell forever? Or uh, who doesn't fear, you know, becoming, uh, like, absorbed into heaven? Like, overwhelmed by the divine, you know, and you lose yourself there. Um if everything goes away eventually and cannot be remembered, then what is the point of anything, you know? So you can kind of be like, yeah, I kind of get Sephiroth's point. Maybe he wants to create a reality, create the future, whereby things won't end, right? So here's the theory in short again. Sephiroth wants to take eternal life by force and make his own stagnant reality or create a future that does not end, right? So that's kind of what I think could be happening. It's the same as the original in a way, right? But now there's a lot more context. So you might ask yourself like, okay, fine. But like, why do we need like time travel? Why do we need multiple timeline or exact reality? And the answer would be to show how Sephiroth will create the future. In the original, he experienced the past and absorbed all its knowledge or, or saw all of it. You know, it's whatever. It's like it's like the same thing. And he says he wants to create in biblical godlike terms, create the future. Okay. And I think in remake, we are seeing that already with scenes like the Harbinger, scenes like the Singularity, scenes like the Edge of Creation. See, uh, you know, we're seeing that already instead of giving us the info dump all at once at the Temple of the Ancients like they do in the original game. You know? Like, in the original game, once you get to the Temple of the Ancients, it's just like, info dump Sephiroth's plan. You know? In Remake, we see visions of Meteor. Right? We see visions of Sephiroth killing Tifa, killing Barret. We see visions of the Holy Materia bouncing on the altar. We see visions of other things too that are all like you know here's the plan you know here's the future this can't be our future right i get why people are like that wasn't in the original though i know but also the info dump at the temple of the ancients you know 
it's it's cool to me that there is context being created and we might get to see the mechanisms utilized for doing so, right? The world's ending. The world's ending. At least that's what everyone's saying. That's what everyone's saying. The sky, I don't like it. Right, so look, this fissure or crack in the heavens. Elmira says the world's ending. We don't know what's going on right here at all. We don't know what is happening here, okay? We don't know if it's a multiple timeline or anything. But I'm just proposing this is the stagnant reality. This is the reality that does not obey the cycle of life, death, and rebirth of the life stream. This is the future that Sephiroth is creating. And I think it's blossoming. Okay? So, have we established precedence then? I think we have. I think I have. I think I have shown that in the original game, there's enough information for all of the shenanigans that you see in Remake. Okay? Look at this image I have on screen right now. There's the Arbiter of Fate. And there's the Time Guardian. We have one in Remake, one in the original, you know? Some more parallels. Let's check this out. Can you guys use it? Nope, we can't use it right now. You need great spiritual power to use it. You mean lots of spiritual energy? That's right. One person's power alone won't do it. Somewhere special where there's plenty of the planet's energy. Oh yeah. The promised land. The promised land? Sephiroth is different. He's not an ancient. He shouldn't be able to find the promised land. Ah, but I have. Okay. So you need great spiritual energy, right? One person's power won't do it. And they're talking about using the black materia here to summon meteor. All right. So here we go. More parallels. Cloud, lend me your strength. Let us defy destiny together. One person's power alone won't do it, right? So, Cloud, lend me your strength. Let us defy destiny together. Never Please, I'm begging you. Lend me your strength. Okay. And in the Japanese there, it's been revealed that she says, Oh, planet, lend me your strength. So, he wants to defy destiny. He wants, he needs other people's strength to harness the spiritual energy. Aerith is trying to defy destiny. Right? She needs the planet to lend her its strength. So, interesting parallels. And we see this here too in the original. Watch this. Okay, this is the, the scene I strode earlier. I gained the knowledge and wisdom. You know, I, I'll create the future. And then Aerith says, I won't let you do it. The future is not just yours. All right, look. And what are we seeing here in Remake, right? We see the big info dump uh, <laughs> in Remake, honestly, of Aerith asking everyone to change themselves and if we change fate we could be changing ourselves and all this stuff sephiroth the original says he's going to create the future Aerith says i won't let you do it the future is not just yours and then we see in remake the standoff between sephiroth and Aerith. sephiroth asking cloud lend me your strength Aerith praying lend me your strength you know in the og i will create the future the future is not yours see you see how it's the same? So, 
one more time. Let's go through, recap the theory again right now. Altering the memory of the planet will corrupt the data of the life stream, allowing it to be influenced by Sephiroth. In the same way that altering the memories of Cloud changes his persona and corrupts him to, to the influence of Sephiroth. This will give Sephiroth the spiritual energy required to summon Meteor. He can achieve this by using the Time Guardian, as well as the illusionary power of Genova to appear to those in the past and set things in motion to create the future. In order to not end, he has to have a stagnant reality that does not work in the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. All right. Sephiroth wants to save the planet by establishing a new nature for how reality works. The problem is that his reality will be a stagnant prison. The cycle of life, death, and rebirth will not exist. My thought is that souls could be trapped there. All right. He'd tell you that he only cares about the planet, that he'd do everything in his power to protect and preserve it. Protect and preserve it. In what way? In a stagnant way. But this isn't the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way it's supposed to be. The way it's supposed to be is the cycle of life, death, and rebirth, right? So Aerith wants to save the planet as well. How she will stop the inevitable death of the planet is a mystery to me. Because even if she stops Meteor, eventually the planet will die, as is the cycle of the life stream. My only thought is that she will reestablish the true cycle of the planet, which is life, death, and rebirth, and perhaps a new way will become possible for them. I don't know. Interesting, too, uh, in the Ultimania, the lead effect artist, Iwa, his comment on Sephiroth's appearance here at the end. He says, this scene is extremely important because it hints at the showdown between the world of the life stream that Aerith represents versus the world of Meteor that Sephiroth represents. It is very fitting that Sephiroth, the strongest villain, appears in the world full of destruction caused by Meteor. So please pay close attention to that. So Sephiroth's world is a world of destruction. It's a stagnant reality that will not end, okay? And Aerith says this is not the way it's supposed to be. He says, she tells us, he'll tell you that he wants to preserve the planet. He wants to save the planet. But it's not the way it's supposed to be. All right? So, was there time travel <laughs> in original Final Fantasy VII? I don't know. <laughs> exactly. It seems like there was a mechanism for it with the Time Guardian. And... We see the parallels between the battle between Aerith and Sephiroth, right? He wants to create the future. She says the future is not yours only. And then in Remake, we have this standoff at the end of the highway, right? The world of Meteor and the world of Lifestream. I think that if Remake is a sequel, it'll make sense that it's a sequel because of the knowledge of the original events. But if it is just a remake, then it will also make sense, right? It will also make sense that these time shenanigans, this future that he wants to create in a biblical godlike sense is being created. And we're seeing that blossom in Zach's story. That's my theory for what's occurring. And that's my preparation for everyone to not be disappointed if it's not a sequel or if it is, all right? I think there's precedence in both uh, cases. Thank you so much for watching the theory video. Um, my name is Michael. I usually make Diablo 2 content, actually. But like I said... I have been very invested in the, over the last three years um, in all of the theory crafting, all of the in the story of Final Fantasy VII Remake. And Final Fantasy VII Original is one of my favorite games of all time in the top five easily. So please uh, like, share, subscribe to the video. Um, if you liked this or if you thought it was thought provoking, you know, subscribe. And, and then uh, as Rebirth comes out, I think if there's more cool theories that blossom from what we learn in that game, I will definitely be all over it. Thank you so much, and see ya. Have a good one. Bye.